Um, I'm here at UBC at the moment, and before we start, I would just like to acknowledge that my place of work lies on the unceded traditional homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sailor Tooth nations. Um, so to make a start, obviously, um, my first slide, um, as Alana has highlighted, we are in 2021, not in 2020. So I apologize for that. Um, but this morning, we're going to do a, um, go through a little bit of information around exercise. So first of all, it's um, really important to consider sort of exercise as part of your entire treatment plan. Um, as much as sort of you may discuss medications, um, exercise should be sort of up there um, in that, that conversation. So as part of this presentation today, we're going to look at sort of the reasons why we should exercise, when um, we should exercise, what we should maybe do, how we can do it, and where. So first of all, the benefits um, of exercise in Parkinson's. So in general, there are many benefits for exercise that we should all be um, participating in, but sort of particularly sort of with the case in, in Parkinson's as well. And um, sort of research studies have showed um, exercise to, to be of great benefit um, to people with Parkinson's. So um, to start with, exercise can help improve just general physical fitness, strength and endurance for all of us sort of in the population. It can improve um, functional tasks such as improving your gait speed. Um, so walking speed is, um, can be correlated to a risk of falls. So obviously optimizing that and maintaining that best as best you can um, can then sort of lead to an ability to hopefully reduce that risk of falls in the future. It can help improve postural stability. Uh, as I said, sort of help improve balance and coordination, reduce stiffness, can help increase your range of motion and flexibility, and can also help to reduce managed fatigue, sort of refill in your energy pot, if you like. So we can look at exercise to help reducing that risk of falls, sort of maintaining your body in as optimum condition as possible. It can help to improve mood, and promote bone health, and that's with weight bearing exercise there, and reduce the risk of osteopenia, osteoporosis. It can assist with bladder and bowel management. It can influence brain plasticity and sort of have a neuroprotective effect. And there are studies of um, studies that have shown that it can really sort of help the the brain cells to use dopamine more efficiently, um, and sort of protect the dopamine that is there. So when should we start? Well, we should start right now. Um, and if we weren't all maybe on video, then we'd get up and sort of move around together. Um, but the key is that we don't want to delay it. Um, I'm a huge procrastinator. There's always tomorrow, there's always another day, but really we should sort of take the reins and sort of, um, get active as, as soon as we can. So the Canadian um, Physical Activity Guidelines um, will give some guidance around sort of how much activity we should be doing. So, um, so they're very similar. They, they separate it out between 18 to 64 year olds and um, 65 and older. Um, so between 18 and 64 years old, really looking at sort of moderate to high intensities. Um, and that's where you should sort of be um, sort of working a little bit harder, your heart rate is up, um, you're having to work a little bit harder to breathe, um, and sort of for the more vigorous sort of high intensity is sort of be a little bit more out of breath. Um, so they recommend at least 150 minutes per week, but this can be broken down. So it doesn't have to be um, sort of in great huge chunks. Um, you know, ideally sort of 30 minutes of activity a day is, is good, but if you're only able to tolerate sort of a, a shorter amount, then that's okay. So if you can um, sort of put it in little uh, groups of sort of 10 minutes or so. Um, they also recommend sort of uh, strengthening um, exercises at least two days a week. Um, and they've actually gone on to sort of take it a little bit further to then look at a 24 hour period. So I think as well as sort of focusing in on the activity that we should be doing sort of, you know, for exercise and the timing there is we should look at our sort of entire day um, 
and certainly it's sort of ensuring that we get good sleep so between 18 and 64 years they recommend seven to nine hours um, we should be limiting our sort of sedentary behavior so um, you know we shouldn't be sedentary for sort of you know more than eight hours and no more than sort of three hours um, recreational screen time and sort of as well as our sort of 150 minutes a week of exercise it's really looking at sort of sort of more hours of sort of lighter physical activity, sort of being up on your feet and sort of moving around there. So when we move on to the sort of 65 and older group, it's very similar sort of in the, the timings and sort of the, the groups of activities they're encouraging. The main difference here is that um, they're really encouraging um, the older adults to have a focus on balance um, and activities that can help to prevent falls as well. Um, when we move on to the looking at the 24 hour period for that, the only difference is the amount of sleep. So instead of seven to nine hours, um, there's a recommendation of seven to eight hours there. Um, and as I say, within that, it's looking at the consistent bedtimes and, and wake up times as well. So having that really good sleep schedule um, and routine for your sort of circadian rhythms. So when we're looking at sort of resources and sort of ways to get active and sort of stay active, Parkinson's Canada has this great um, physical activity um, guideline. And again, it's sort of addressing sort of why we look at different activities such as aerobic activity, strengthening, balance and flexibility. Um, and then has a little chart for you to sort of record what you what you may do. And I know the Parkinson Society of BC um, has a, an exercise booklet underway um, with their neurophysiotherapist Shelley. Um, and so hopefully that will be available sort of in the near future. So when it comes to exercise, a lot of questions I get are what's the best exercise for Parkinson's? Um, and there isn't there's sort of many research studies out there that have looked at different um, sort of types of exercise, but really ultimately it's something that you enjoy because you've got to continue it. This is not just a, something you're going to do sort of momentarily and then once you feel a bit better, you're going to stop. This is a, you know, a lifelong um, sort of activation that we really want to sort of encourage and incorporate um, so it becomes part of your daily routine. But saying that, we do want to sort of look at a broader aspect of um, activities and, and what to include. So you want to have some aspect of sort of aerobic activity, strengthening, working on balance, flexibility, and then a huge area that I will often talk about um, and sort of people that come to see me in clinic will hear is really looking at posture and core muscle activity. I think a lot of us sort of over our years will sort of focus on sort of going to the gym or biking or walking or swimming and and sort of working on maybe some weight activities but sort of we often forget about sort of our our posture and our core muscles that really provide that stability um sort of behind the movement of our arms and legs and really give our body that foundation to be able to sort of use our our movement and our strength more efficiently When we're looking at options for exercise, um, I think this year, this last year with our pandemic has really shown us that um, it's been tough. It's been tough for people that would often rely on accessing classes out in the community, being able to socialize a lot more with um, friends and in, in group scenarios and, um, you know, being able to participate in sort of many things that have maybe been put on hold or delayed or, you know, had a, a period of time where they have stopped, um, that it can be a challenge. That being said, that it's also opened up opportunities for things to become online and then hopefully, um, you know, broaden the area to, to the number of people it can reach. So those of um, those people living in sort of more remote areas um, that wouldn't necessarily have had access to a class before may now have access to a class with it being online. So there are some different um, exercise groups that are specific for people with Parkinson's. So we have the Parkinson's Wellness Recovery um, group and that's led by Dr. Becky Farley down in Arizona. We have Rock Steady Boxing. Um, the LSVT Big and Loud group, which will look at big movements and, and loud voices. 
We have PD Warrior that comes out of Australia. Dance for PD is a, a big group, um, again, sort of specialist sort of dance moves for people with Parkinson's. And then we have other um, sort of things to consider like Tai Chi um, and walking, swimming, pickleball, um, yoga, sort of Pilates, sort of many different options there. So when we're considering exercise, um, everyone's in a very different place. So some people may have been sort of very active um, throughout their life leading up to the diagnosis. Some people maybe not so much. Um, so it, it can be a little bit overwhelming and conversations are often sort of along the lines of if, if you don't exercise is how you start. And if you're used to doing a lot more that maybe you can't do as much, how do you adapt? Um, so it's it's really looking at sort of what you're doing at the moment um, and sort of considering that, you know, if you are doing some activities, what else you may need to include in, in your routine and in your sort of, in your regime there. Um, it may be that you're new to exercise or you have some other health conditions that you need to consider. And so that's really important um, factor that um, you may have sort of all the best intentions, but if you have, maybe some previous injuries to sort of joints or muscles, or you have other sort of health conditions, any heart or lung conditions that you need to consider. Um, it's really important that you're sort of consulting with medical professionals and sort of really making sure that um, what you choose to do and what you want to do, you're able to do in a, a safe way. Um, so there is the PARQ plus physical activity readiness questionnaire that you can complete. Um, and I have that in a couple of slides ahead that I can show you. And then if that highlights some areas that um, are maybe sort of questionable, you may then want to sort of consult with your doctor and they can complete the EPARMEDX um, plus form just to sort of clarify if there's any restrictions on um, maybe the level of heart rate that they want you achieve, to achieve or sort of to not get to or sort of any considerations that sort of medically you need to have when you're moving forward in exercise. You want to consider sort of the frequency of exercise, intensity, time and type. So frequency, as I say, really, Ultimately, you want to be aiming for sort of doing something each day if possible. And when you're starting out, that may not be possible. If you experience um, quite a lot of fatigue, that might not be possible. And so it's really looking at um, your individual self and making those assessments and really listening to your body. Um, so as I say, ideally every day, if we aim for that, then often we can get sort of four to five times a week. Um, when I speak with people, often they may be aiming sort of for three to four times a week and they may do it once or twice. Um, but you want to set yourself some realistic goals. You don't want to sort of feel that you're not able to achieve things that, that you are setting out. And it may be if you're still working, that will be a factor. Um, if you have family commitments, um, there, are, there are sort of different sort of factors that can influence your, your ability to have that frequency um, of activity there. When we're looking at intensities, so the studies have shown sort of that the, the higher intensity exercise, um, sort of moderate to sort of high intensity exercise um, can be sort of more beneficial, but that's not saying that lower intensity in, in exercise isn't beneficial. Um, any activity is beneficial to our body there. Um, and as I say, when you're sort of the, the, the theories around or the, um, specifics around sort of a high intensity is sort of really working at 70 to 85 percent of your maximum heart rate um, and as a, a very sort of general way of measuring that sort of your your maximum heart rate is usually measured um, by deducting your age from 220 so you'd work at 70 to 85 percent of that number um, and a moderate intensity is really working at 50 to 70 percent of your maximum heart rate. Um, but ultimately, if it's not challenging you in some way, then it's um, it's not really going to provide the change that you're maybe looking for. It does need to sort of give you that little bit of challenge in your in your body, and that challenge may look different in each individual. Um, 
so looking and considering the, the time. So again, it may be sort of time in the factor of how long you're going to spend in each session. Um, so that may be 10 or 15 minutes, it may be 30 minutes, it may be 45 minutes or an hour's class that you're um, participating in. But it's also considering the time of day or time in with medications. Um, and you really want to try and find the best time of day for, for you in sort of in your body's ability to participate in those movements that you're asking it to do. Um, again, sort of if you have other commitments with family or work, then that that may influence um, what when you're able to to exercise or be active. Or if you're um, sort of joining a specific class, then that's often going to be at a set time. So um, it's looking for options that do fit in with your um, sort of your sort of daily routines, your medication routines um, that sort of really gives you the the, the best opportunity to, to move. Um, as I said, type of exercise is sort of it's very individual. Um, if you're not a gym person, don't try and force yourself to go to the gym because it's, it's not going to work. If you um, don't like moving in water, then don't try swimming. It's, you know, you've got to find something that you really enjoy um, to, to really have that sustainability and to have that commitment to the, the movement there. You want to pace yourself and build up gradually. So, you know, for any of us, when we're, when we're starting out, we, if we've never, you know, run 5K before, we're, we're not going to go out and run that 5K straight away. You're going to build up to it. And that's the case with any kind of exercise. Um, that you want to sort of make sure you're pacing, um, sort of providing rest breaks that you may even need initially to have sort of breaks between the days of exercising, sort of to help your body adjust to any soreness or achiness. It's sort of natural and normal to feel a little bit achy when you're doing something new that your body's not used to doing. Um, but you don't want that to last for an extended period of time, sort of more than a couple of days. Then it may be that you've sort of pushed yourself a little bit too far, that you've done a little bit too much. And you certainly don't want to be forcing through um, any pain. It's it's not a situation of no pain, no gain. Um, you know, if you're if you're experiencing pain or discomfort in some way, then you need to sort of look at what that reason could be and uh, address that issue. And as I said, exercise should challenge you physically, but also cognitively. So, um, you know, over time, it can often become a little bit more difficult to um, to have those sort of multi multitasking abilities and um, sort of, you know, distractions can kind of take away from sort of balance and physical abilities there. So it's it's given those challenges cognitively and it, it may be, you know, there are sort of many different things sort of as you're exercising it, it um, some examples that I know are used in classes are sort of as you're sort of doing reps or, or rallies in things is that you're then having to name sort of animals through the alphabet or, you know, countries or cars, whatever an interest is. Um, and so you can go through that and you can do that with a partner as well or have someone asking you a question so that you're not already thinking about the answer when um, when you're going to, to say it so they can provide that outside input to, to challenge you a little bit more there. So other considerations um, for exercise are whether you want to do something in your home or whether you want to go out into the community. Um, some people don't want to be out in a, in a group or sort of visible to other people. They much prefer doing their own individual exercise at home. Um, I've learned a lot over this last year that people have set up some sort of equipment and sort of activities in, in their home spaces um, and are using that or, um, or doing individual things sort of outside in, in a, you know, a park setting when the, when the weather sort of allows that. Or you may be someone that actually needs that group to, um, to sort of have that accountability to, to do things. Um, and so it's it's really sort of choosing what works best for you. You want to incorporate it into your daily routines. 
so let's say if you put it as part of your sort of your schedule, um, then it can help just to keep that consistency. And as much as if you are taking medications, um, you would maybe have a little alarm on your phone or, you know, some way of sort of recognizing when you need to take your medication for the timing, it's often encourage people to sort of set that for exercise as well. So it may be that at 10 a.m. every day, you're gonna go and sort of do your, your exercise routine or sort of your 30 minutes or 15 minutes, um, or you have a specific class that you're going to on a Tuesday and Thursday at 11, sort of you, you have that in, in your routine, in your sort of daily, weekly schedule there. So it's often good to set yourself a goal. Um, and sort of when you're looking at this, it's, you can kind of have maybe shorter term goals and, and longer term goals um, for yourself, but you want them to be realistic. So you don't want to set yourself anything that you know ultimately that you're not going to achieve um, because it's, it's never good to feel like you're sort of not achieving or, or potentially failing at something. Um, but it's also recognizing that in, in setting goals that there are going to be sort of you know, fluctuations and if you like speed bumps along the way to, to get there, that it's maybe not going to be sort of smooth sailing. Um, so then that's where you want to sort of, as I go down, sort of to have a backup plan sort of for the, the off days where you can still maybe um, do something, but not to the extent that you maybe have wanted to do before. So maybe your goal is to walk, you know, 30 minutes each day but one day you're, you know you're just you're not feeling it it's, it's not sort of not working then maybe you can still go for a walk but maybe it's a 10 minute walk or a 15 minute walk you've still got out and done something but it's um you know it's it's trying not to sort of give up on that activity in that day um because then sometimes we can we can find that, that can lead into the next day and the next day and the next day um so trying something um, is is better than sort of nothing. Obviously, there might be those days where it's just not going to happen. And again, that's okay. We just sort of, that happens on that day and the next day is a new day, a fresh day, and you can kind of start with your, your goal again. Um, you can use technology to sort of track your progress. And I think many people now will have um, smartphones um, with apps on them that will count their steps or they may have um, sort of a sort of a, a watch or a sort of a Fitbit or a Garmin or you know some kind of device that will sort of track their um, their activity levels and that's kind of good to you know if you respond to that to to have that sort of accountability and that comparison so you can see your trends from day to day or week to week um, you know, and, and maybe sort of looking at, at times where you are more active in the day where you're less and um, sort of when we go back to that 24 hour period of, of activity and, um, you know, it can help manage that sort of in, in sort of balancing the sleep and activity and sedentary behavior um, to, to sort of help us get that, that balance um, across all of those um, areas. So it's also important to seek support, um, and that may be sort of from family, from friends, or from professionals. Um, and it's sort of and never be afraid to to ask. Um, I know in these times when we're all meant to be physically distancing from each other, it is harder. We're not able to see our family, um, you know, perhaps, or we're not able to connect with our friends. Um, luckily, here in BC, we are still able to sort of get outside with a with a friend and sort of be distant. So that may be a way to still seek that support. Or you may want to connect online with someone virtually. Um, maybe you're both joining a, an online class um, together, or you're going to connect and do your own workouts together, or just even sort of checking in and, and chatting with each other to sort of see where you're at um, with your activities and your goals and sort of where, um, how your week's been going. Um, you want to sort of really ensure your safety and again that's sort of to prevent any sort of other injuries any musculoskeletal injuries to joints or muscles um, but also to ensure sort of that you're sort of stable and, and balanced in the activities that you're doing that you're not sort of pushing beyond your body's capability and therefore risking um, sort of falls or imbalances there 
but really most importantly it's to have fun um, and if that's you know putting some music on at home and and dancing and moving your body away with no specific things then that's great if it's getting out and going for a walk or a run or a bike ride that's great um, so sort of just whatever you can to sort of have fun with it include family children um, anything there so this is the um, the Park U Plus. So this is just the first page of it, um, and it's just um, going along to um, sort of check off if you have any health conditions, and then sort of if it's somewhere where you'd need to sort of maybe discuss further with your with your doctors, sort of with your family doctors, to um, if they have any concerns or any recommendations for moving forward with with exercise there. So looking at um, resources for exercise. So this is where I've really seen in the last year that a lot of organizations have really um, sort of come together and, and stepped up to provide more opportunities for people, especially online. Um, so the Parkinson Society of BC has been fantastic and their um, physio Shelley Yu has um, done a lot of exercise classes um, which have been recorded and are available on their website um, and they also have links to sort of other resources and activities there and have included um, sort of many events and, and programs um, including sort of dance and and sort of other activities um, we have the BC brain wellness program which is um, a program that was initiated through um, uh, one of our neurologists in um, UBC, Dr. Creswell, along with Dr. Jack Taunton. And this is a program that looks not just only at exercise, but other um, opportunities and, and activities to sort of incorporate for, for a holistic look at, at brain health and, and brain wellness. There is an exercise component there, um, as well as yoga um, and dance. And these are, are free programs that you can sign up for. And currently, um, they are online. Um, NeuroFit BC is a, a private um, physio, Naomi Kosiro. Um, she is, again, a, a physio who's done a lot um, with the Parkinson Society of BC and, and in the um, past has set up uh, one of the uh, the only retreat um, for people with Parkinson's and she um, has classes but also has online free videos um, that you can access through her website. Um, Impact Parkinson's is a group in New West and unfortunately due to the pandemic they had to close their physical doors but they are still doing online um, activities. The Parkinson's Wellness Project is based in Victoria um, again, providing online exercise um, groups there. And then you can also sort of seek out a, a physiotherapist. And this is the website for the, the BC Physio College to find a physio. Um, so with that, um, when you go onto that website, there's a little box in the right hand corner that's find a physio. And then you can put in your search criteria. So you can put in your area. And then really um, for working, for finding someone with experience or knowledge um, with people with Parkinson's, you really want to put in the area of practice neurology. And then that will um, bring you up with hopefully people in your area. Um, if you live more remotely, there may be um, less access. Um, but again, you will often find that the physios working in more remote areas um, do have a broader range of experience. Um, and we'll have done some, some extra training. You may also want to work with a kinesiologist or a personal trainer. Um, and really sort of looking at sort of what opportunities are available in your community. So sort of pre-pandemic that would have been as well through local community centers, and they would often run a lot of classes um, there. And so sort of a couple of other sort of community um, resources is the choose to move is a, is a free six month um, approach for sort of anyone over 65 um, and they provide you a link to sort of you know a little bit of a um, sort of exercise specialist sort of trainer if you like and they think that has moved on line um, 
and sorry um, and then we have the HealthLink BC um, so you can call 811 and they will link you with a physical activity specialist um, who will be able to help talk through goals and goal setting for exercise and and sort of point you in directions of resources and things available so it's, it's that's sort of wrapping up the exercise portion. I know sort of there was a, a thing to sort of also talk about living well with Parkinson's. And this, these slides are certainly um, used with sort of permission of our nurse practitioner, Joanna, who was in clinic, um, who looked at this um, last year when we were, we met as a group in person. So it's really, um, to look at, um, it's sort of this quote is quite a nice little quote in that life is like um, riding a bicycle and to keep your balance you must keep moving and I think ultimately that is the key that we don't want to be sedentary we need to keep moving um, we need to keep our bodies moving our bodies active to maximize and optimize our ability um, in our movements sort of you know over the years it's important that we um, connect with others, um, that we look at sort of other my lifestyle modification, modifications and sort of really instill healthy lifestyle habits. And so that may be sort of considering sleep. Sort of when we looked at that 24 hour activity pattern, sleep is a, a huge um, factor there. It may be sort of, um, sort of managing stress or anxiety. It may be sort of looking at healthy eating habits. Um, and we want to be sort of kind to ourselves and engage in relaxation therapies, be able to take that time to sort of really sort of disconnect in a way and um, and sort of provide that sort of relaxation sort of level. We want to stay active. Um, we want to build a, a care team um, to have people around us that are supporting us and also to stay informed. So coming to sort of presentations, webinars like this is, is a way to stay informed. But there are lots of resources and um, information out there through different organizations and different groups. Um, I definitely would encourage people to sort of use those um, sort of professional platforms such as the, the Parkinson's Society of BC, sort of Parkinson's Canada, Parkinson's Foundation. Um, there as sources of information. So when we're looking at your team, we really want to sort of consider all aspects of the team. Now the next slide is a little busy. Um, these are some of the people that may be um, included sort of in your team. So we have a range of medical professionals that you might want to access. Um, we have your own sort of social networks, your family and friends, your um, sort of you know social connections and, and care partners out out in the community it may be support groups that you access maybe a personal trainer sort of linking with the Parkinson Society um, there. so sort of looking at additional strategies sort of for living well with Parkinson's is is knowing sort of when and how to access different resources and so you know, you may want to access speech and language therapy at, at some point or occupational therapy, um, considering all aspects of, of daily life and, and working life. Physio, you may want to speak with um, social worker if, um, you know, having a new diagnosis of Parkinson's can be challenging at times and can provide um, sort of emotional uh, reactions there. And so accessing sort of counseling in, in some way may be of benefit. You may want to con connect with a dietitian and sort of look at sort of healthy eating um, habits there, considering sort of good sleep hygiene, making sure that sort of you're, you're, you're getting those regular sort of consistent wake up times and bedtimes and that good sleep across the night. Um, and then looking at ways that you can reduce stress and sort of manage any anxiety there. So really some key messages um, sort of from our information, um, I think is that sort of the Parkinson's disease sort of progresses slowly um, and there are things that you can do to manage it and control it and exercise along with the medications can control symptoms very well. Um, you certainly don't have to go through it alone. 
um, make sure you're reaching out for support as you um, as you're able to and as you need it. And really, it's just trying to focus on living the best life you can and being proactive. Don't wait for something to be sort of challenging or or sort of you know being difficult. Sort of you know be proactive and, and take action sort of as soon as you're sort of noticing something. And that there are things, there are sort of advanced therapies, there are sort of promising sort of things in research that are being done to help manage. And so really sort of coming back to the the informed sort of decisions and, and sort of seeking information is that you don't want to believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a photo with a quote next to it. And so really from that, it's really looking at reliable resources of information. Um, and sort of the societies and foundations are excellent resources of information there. I think we are going to finish just a few minutes earlier. I know I see Dr. Squires has joined us already. Um, but yeah, so that is our talk about exercise. Alana, I'm not sure if there are questions specific to me that people have before Dr. McKenzie joins us. And I see that Dr. McKenzie has joined us now as well. Michelle, there are a couple of questions in the <clears throat> chat box. Okay. Exercise related. I think one is: Is it important to target the extremity that is most affected by PD? Okay. So, um, in answering that question, uh, not particularly. No. Um, I mean, yes, we want to um, make sure we're including that that limb um, in exercise. But really, when we're looking at exercise, we're looking at all body encompassing exercise, um, and really looking at um, a way to make movements big, um, but you may have a little bit more of a need to focus on the limb that is more effective to make sure it's achieving as much of the movement as you can. Um, and then there's another question. What are examples of cognitively challenging exercises? Um, so it may be that, I mean, I think I gave sort of one example in sort of when you're exercising, you may be um, sort of calling out sort of names of things. It may be names of cars. It may be names of animals or sort of counting, counting backwards. It may be that um, you set up yourself with um, colored discs on the floor or sort of colored patches on the wall and then you're targeting a limb towards a certain color and it, that may be needing someone else to sort of give you that that prompt um, if you think a little bit like twister in a way where someone's saying left foot to yellow dot um, then that may be a way that you can challenge cognitively there great and then um I have significant arthritis in my hands and wrist, making weight training pretty much impossible. Any suggestions? Thanks in advance. Um, good question. So I think for that, definitely you'd probably want to see someone um, specifically to have a, an individual assessment because you'd need to be really careful in um, joint protection for your arthritis. It may be that you can use resistance in other ways or other parts of your body to provide that resistance and that that sort of 
um, strength training, weight training there, but um, definitely it would require a little bit more of an individual assessment. Great. And then can you please comment on walking off your Parkinson's? Okay, I'm not sure if I've necessarily heard that phrase before. Um, okay, I'm, I'm trying to think what that what that might mean. Um, I mean, I think definitely sort of walking is a really important um, activity and something that um, can become more challenging or people will notice um, sort of changes in their walking pattern, particularly they may find that they're not stepping as big or they're not maybe striking their heel as much, um, not swinging their arms. So um, you definitely, when you're walking, want to sort of have a little bit of a focus on all of those components in, in sort of building up that um, sort of that walking pattern and sort of maximizing in that. But as to walking off the Parkinson's, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe it's the the fact that exercise does is a symptomatic treatment for Parkinson's as well. So people do find if they start exercising more that their motor symptoms improve as well. So I'm not yeah. sure if that's it, Wendy. If there's something else um, that you had in mind, you can send a follow up, and we'll try to address that uh, as well. Um, and then um, on the exercise theme, Mike said music, martial arts, dancing? Question mark. Absolutely, all of them. <laughs> Go for it. Um, anything you can do. I think if you can add music into something, it makes it a lot more fun. Um, some people do find that music can be a little bit distracting with movement, but I think, again, having that cognitive challenge of adding music, adding another factor into it um, is great. And I think, um, yeah, anything that is moving your body, again sort of with the parkinson's particularly we want to be looking at big movements as well so anything that's encouraging your body to move as a whole and big is is wonderful great and then joan asked i've read that singing is good both for strengthening voice and helping with swallowing can you comment so i think i can feel that one um it basically singing is essentially a form of speech therapy um and we do know that speech therapy helps people with parkinson's with both of those things and so basically anything that you can do where you're using your voice and projecting is going to help with the caveat being that you have to keep doing it because if you stop doing whatever you're doing you lose the benefit fairly quickly uh, and there is specific speech therapy for Parkinson's called LSVT loud. Um, but I think basically anything where you're focused on speaking loudly and projecting, like Michelle said with the exercise, just make everything big. Um, one of the one of the problems with Parkinson's is that your brain thinks your thinks your output is of a normal size, but it's actually everything's coming out smaller. So you really have to exaggerate it, and you might feel like you're yelling, but you're actually speaking at what used to be a normal volume. So you're trying to normalize, make big normal, basically. Um, is there any evidence that a high dairy diet is not good for PD? Dr. McKenzie, any thoughts? <laughs> um, not that I'm aware of. So we know, as we talked about in the treatment uh, seminar, that for some people, um, the protein can interact with their medication. And so things that uh, are dairy products, milk, cheese, yogurt, etc., do have some amount of protein. So some people would find their medication works better when they move that away from uh, uh, the diet. But we all need uh, some amount of protein to keep our muscles healthy. So certainly uh, cutting out protein protein from your diet is, is not a healthy thing to be doing. And the vast majority of people actually don't need to, to move their medications away from protein, uh, but some people might do it if they're finding the medicine isn't as effective or isn't working as much as they uh, think it should be. Uh, so in general, uh, high dairy diet, not specifically indicated for PD, but uh, I think sort of a, a healthy, well-rounded diet that includes protein, in and dairy, uh, if those are things that you tolerate, uh, is reasonable. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, basically what we know about diet in Parkinson's is not all that much. Um, there is a one of my one of our colleagues at UBC, I just learned, just published a paper that 
people who follow the MIND diet, M-I-N-D, most closely um, have much later onset of their Parkinson's disease. And there certainly does seem to be some effect on slowing brain aging. Um, but we don't have much more specifics than that. It's basically a modified Mediterranean diet, more focused on plant-based foods, fewer you know, healthy fats, that sort of thing. So M-I-N-D, you can look that up on the internet. It's readily available. Um, I am not currently on medication for PD. How long does it take for levodopa to make a difference? Um, basically, you should notice some change fairly quickly. When you first start it, we usually build it up slowly just so that you don't get side effects, especially nausea. Um, but usually within a couple of weeks, you should notice a, an improvement. Um, it's a bit of a nobody... There's no one size fits all approach for Parkinson's disease. So we have to adjust the dose a little bit. Some people need a little more, some people need a little less. So it's a bit um, of time playing around. Having said that 20% of people don't notice a huge improvement in their tremor right away. And you might need a very high dose to control your tremor. So sometimes we try other, other treatments for that, but you should notice fairly quickly. Okay, um, Michelle, um, do you have a recommend recommendation for walking support in the home when balance is a concern? Uh, walking stick, walker, any pros and cons to devices like tripping hazards? Okay, so um, yes, I mean, certainly if you have balance challenges, uh, walking aid may be necessary. Um, again, this would need an individual assessment. So, um, you know, if a if a cane or a walking stick is going to give enough stability, then then that may be um, that may be fine. A lot of people will use walking poles. Um, a benefit to using walking poles is that they actually promote a more upright posture. Um, some people have difficulty coordinating two of the poles, um, and so may use one pole instead. Um, a walker. It can be useful. Again, when you're using a walker, it will tend to sort of bring you a little bit more flex, a little bit more forward, just naturally because you're holding something in front of you. Um, you do, I do find the walkers with four wheels um, are a little bit more, a little easier to move around. Um, but would often recommend someone have something such as slow down brakes um, on the back of them so they can just adjust the tension and um, just sort of prevent the walker from running away from them a little bit. Um, it's that, that, ca that can have a tendency sometimes, but again, it, it would really need a sort of an individual assessment. So, um, so either com a community therapist or an outpatient therapist, a private therapist could could look at that for you. And I will say my own observation has been that people with Parkinson's with canes tend to pick up the cane and carry it and it often doesn't make much contact with the floor. Um, so walking yeah. poles and walkers are often somewhat more useful. Um, but it's obviously individual like Michelle said. Um, I think sometimes then, as well it can be um, it can provide just a little visual cue to other people around to kind of give you a little bit more of a, a wider berth and you know, a lot of us nowadays, people are walking and looking at their phones and not really paying attention. So hopefully they'd pay a little bit more attention and not sort of run into you quite so much um, sort of if you if you have something. Mm -hmm. um, Alana, did you want to try um, reading out some of the questions? Sure. Can you, oh, we can hear can you now. Can you yep. guys hear me right now? We can. Okay, yep. perfect. You're back. I'm not sure what I'm not sure what happened there. Um, so are we we're just doing the exercise questions right now? No, just anything. I'm just working through the list in in order here. Okay, the, so here's, here's an exercise one for you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, how important is novelty when it comes to exercise? We want to do something that we are comfortable with, but is there are there some disadvantage disadvantages to doing the same exercises day after day? And rather, is it better to challenge oneself with new exercises? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think novelty um, is important, um, but it's difficult to find a novel thing to do, something new to do every day for a number of years. Um, often what I will do for people is give a range of exercises that then you can choose from. So it may be sort of that you have a, a number of exercises and you pick a portion of them to do each day. So each day you may be changing up what, what you're doing rather than doing the same 10 exercises every day, day in, day out, that your body's getting a little bit of a, a difference there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have um, some more questions if I could ask those as well right now. Jonathan, is that okay? Yeah, for sure. 
Um, so I have a couple questions here from David. Um, the question is, I'm not yet taking any PD medication. How long does it take for levodopa to take effect once started um, in terms of hours or days? Oh, I think David actually put the, that in his question about the high dairy diet in the chat. So we've actually already gone through those ones. Okay, and um, I also have a question here from Joy. Most evenings I get a sensation of a thick tongue and notice my speech is slightly slurred. Are you aware of this happening to others? Dr. McKenzie? Um, I think it's, it can, I guess, be from a number of different things. It's probably something that's best to uh, discuss with your uh, physician. Um, certainly, sometimes people do notice different symptoms at different stages of the medication dose that they're taking. Uh, so going over that with your physician about whether it might be related to levodopa or other medications, um, that's something I think sort of best reviewed with your physician. I wouldn't say it's a typical symptom that I see in every everyone, uh, but that doesn't mean that it can't be related to the Parkinson's or the medication. And symptoms okay, in general will be a bit worse in the evening when you're tired as well. And so it's not that uncommon to have a little bit of, you know, slurring of your speech just in the evening and the sort of continuum of the ways that Parkinson's can affect your voice. Okay. Um, and I also have a question from Kathy. Uh, her question is, I had a skull fracture when I was eight months old. Can my Parkinson's disease be a result of that injury? That, so we do know that it's, it's very difficult to say for any one individual, for any one event. We do know that across the population, people with re recurrent head injuries have a higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So think about boxers like Muhammad Ali, for example, they're constantly taking blows to the head. Um, so that comes out as a risk factor. We don't know exactly what that is. And some of those people have a different condition called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is a bit controversial with the NFL and NHL and whatnot. Um, but recurrent head injury does seem to be a risk. Whether one particular incident was a contributor, it's no one can really say for sure, I don't think, especially when it was so remote. Okay, great, thanks. I do have some other questions here, but maybe we can go back to the chat box and come back to me. Sure. Later. Okay, uh, is there any medication that will stop the hand tremor? Levodopa does not stop it for me. Um, so the, the tremor can be a tricky thing with Parkinson's to, to manage. So um, as Dr. Squires had mentioned earlier, sometimes it does take higher doses of levodopa to manage the tremor compared to the other motor symptoms, which might respond to lower doses. Um, there are other specific medications that can sometimes help with tremor. Mm -hmm. uh, however, those medications tend to with more in the way of side effects. So usually it's sort of a, a risk benefit uh, scenario to be discussing with your physician, whether it's worthwhile to be starting the, those other medicines. I will say the majority of people with Parkinson's or medication, it's sort of usually to get it at a point where it's manageable and less bothersome for you. Um, but the, there are other options other than the levodopa mm -hmm. uh, yeah. for some people. Yeah, it's often difficult to, for any symptom to take it away completely. And so it really is about finding that balance, like Dr. McKenzie said, where you're, where you're able to function, able to do the things you wanna do with a acceptable burden of side effects. Um, okay, and then, Bob asks, how is it the constipation is both a symptom of PD and a possible side effect of levodopa? That is an excellent question. Um, so I think some of that is that when you are looking at a new drug, like a, a clinical trial, you record every time you, you see the, the participant in follow-up, you record any new symptom that they have. And if someone reports their constipation for the first time after they've started the drug, you record that as a possibly related side effect of the drug. Um, so I think that's some of it in that we're just, people are 
reporting their Parkinson's symptoms and then it, they're but they're in this trial and so they report that as a possible adverse effect of the drug so that's part of it having said that I do have a few patients who very consistently had no constipation started levodopa and then developed constipation very shortly after starting it I don't know what the answer to that is. It should theoretically help constipation if it was going to do anything, but it's possible that there's a subtype of Parkinson's disease where the, the bowel is sensitive to dopamine such that it makes it worse. I'm not sure. There, there's, a, there's a lot that we don't understand about PD. Um, okay, maybe we'll do one more and then Alain will go back to you. Um, so we were wondering why it seems just one side is most affected, um, for example, tremor in only one hand, at least initially. Do you want to take that, Dr. McKenzie? Sure. It's a, it's a good question. We, we know that when we study lots of different patients with Parkinson's, the other, that side tends to stay more affected as Parkinson's changes over the years. So some people uh, might have more tremor on one side. That same side may have more stiffness, slowness, trouble with dexterity using your hand, for example. That foot may be a bit slower if you're walking, um, but it's not fully understood why this starts on one side, although we do know it's, it's asymmetric, different side to side. Um, and we also don't have a good reason why one person has their left side more affected and, and someone else has their right side more affected. It seems to be uh, quite random and that's part of Parkinson's that we know it happens this way, but, but we don't really know why as of yet. Great. Um, okay. okay, so I can ask some questions if you guys like. Um, I'm confused about protein intake. On the one hand, we are told to avoid protein with medication, but also told to eat the Mediterranean diet, which seems to have a lot of protein in it. Could you clarify, please? Yeah, so the concern with protein is that um, protein is made up of amino acids. So the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. And when you eat protein, it gets broken down and you absorb amino acids. Um, levodopa is an amino acid as well. And so it gets absorbed out of the gut by the same sort of machinery that absorbs protein, essentially. And if you, for some people, if you have all kinds of protein in your gut and you've, you've flooded those receptors and transporters and then there's no room left for the medication and so you you can't absorb the medication as well and then that also happens in transporting the the levodopa out of the blood and into the brain across the blood brain barrier and so if if you have too much protein around around the time you have your pills they may not kick in as well and they may not last as long when that's been studied it's only clinically meaningful in other words people only notice it in about 15 10 to 15 maybe 20 percent of people um, it tends to be people with more advanced Parkinson's as well. And basically, if you don't notice a difference in how your medicine works, whether you have, you know, I don't know, a tuna sandwich while you're taking your pills um, versus if you have your pills an hour before your tuna sandwich, then you don't need to worry about it. But if you're noticing that sometimes a, a given dose of your med medicine is taking forever, like an hour to kick in, then it would be worth trying to separate it out from protein to see if it makes a difference for you. So it, it's important for the people that it's important for, and if it's not important for you, it's not important. <laughs> so it's, it's yeah, it's a bit confusing. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Another question here. I think you heard um, yeah, Go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, in general, we're not just because protein can interact for some people. It's more about the timing of it, as Dr. Squire said, rather than cutting out protein from your diet, um, I think is also important. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to have it at least, if, if, if there's an interaction, you want to have your protein, your, your meds at least 30 minutes, preferably an hour before you eat and or an hour later, just to let everything clear through. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here. Can aggressive behavior like physically lashing out and anger happen in Parkinson's in earlier stages that might not have anything to do with dementia that 
we sometimes see in later stage Parkinson's? Um, potentially, although I would hesitate to necessarily blame just the Parkinson's for that. The, the agitation is usually, usually comes along with cognitive issues. Um, certainly you can develop cognitive issues early in the course of Parkinson's disease that can happen. Um, and lots of people can develop lots of psychiatric symptoms so people can become quite irritable, anxious, um, but lashing out would be a bit unusual. Sometimes the medication side effect as well. So some people are quite sensitive to high levels of dopamine and that can cause agitation and hallucinations and whatnot. Um, so it would be, you know, good to, to follow up that and make sure there's not something else going on too, I think. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Um, another question. With my new diagnosis, am I supposed to report this to the motor vehicle branch? Will I be prohibited from driving with a new diagnosis? If not, under which circumstances might a neurologist prohibit a patient from driving with Parkinson's? Do you want to take that? Um, no, yeah, but I'm not. Is it a reportable condition? I know it's on the. Yeah, it's, no. I didn't think so. So, the, um, so most people with early Parkinson's, there's not a concern uh, for driving. So, as as Dr. Squires was just uh, <laughs> uh, confirming, it's not something that has to be reported uh, to the motor vehicle branch. I have had people request me to do uh, sort of a, a driving evaluation with the Parkinson's. Um, and generally it's something that in early Parkinson's, we don't tend to have many concerns. As things change over the years, um, it, it becomes sort of a, a conversation. So if someone's reaction times are, are quite slowed, we might be talking about making sure you're only driving when your medications are kicked in and working well, uh, avoiding being behind the wheel uh, if you're tired, if your medications are wearing off, or if you're sort of not feeling well that day. Um, and then driving is a quite complex cognitive task. So if someone's having sort of different difficulty in their day-to-day -day life doing things like uh, multitasking in that, then sometimes we might be concerned uh, about, uh, about how the driving is going. Uh, so usually this is a, a conversation with your physicians kind of over the years as things change. But there, just because you have a diagnosis of Parkinson's certainly does not mean your license is, is taken away. Um, that's kind of something that may evolve over, over the years. And generally, when it's researched, the the best predictor of having a problem with your driving is when your family has concerns about your driving. So, um, the question that is, you know, physicians were sort of trained to ask is, you know, would you would you feel comfortable with your grandchild in the back seat of your car? And if the answer is no, then you shouldn't be driving, basically. Um, and it is a it is a the things that get in the, in the way, as Dr. McKenzie said, are usually cognitive and people have problems with visual spatial processing as well. So figuring out how far away you are from other lanes, how far that kid on the side of the street is down the block, who's you know about to chase the ball into the street um, and then slowed reaction time as well. So, I mean, Parkinson's disease, you slow down, right? So you have to be able to slam your slam the brakes on if someone does run out in front of you or or changes lanes or something like that. So it's it's not always straightforward to figure out when. There's no one test that you can do to say if you score X on this test, you you can't drive anymore. It really is a an ongoing. It's it's a there's a big gray area, shall we say? So it, it's challenging, and you can have um, a road test done through ICBC if you if there's any concerns, and they they're ultimately it's ICBC who decides if you can drive or not. It's not your your doctor. All that we can do is if we have concerns, we're legally reported to report you report it to ICBC, and then they do an assessment, and they're the ones who make up their make make the decision. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, is dyskinesia only caused by long-term use of levodopa, or can it also be caused directly by the PD itself? I think um, we touched on this uh, quite a bit in our uh, talk on medication. So the the 
it's a combination of both, actually, the Parkinson's diseases as well as the medication. So most people, you know, if, if you are not on any medication for Parkinson's, most people would not have dyskinesias. Uh, but as we talked about, it's usually the brain changing over time that leads to the dyskinesias. So for example, we talked, I think, about peak dose dyskinesias. So that therapeutic window of where the medication is working and working well tends to narrow over time. And it's harder with your individual medication doses to stay in there kind of without overshooting. And so you can get sort of peak dose dyskinesias from the medication, but they're only there because the brain with Parkinson's has changed uh, over the years. Yeah, and there, there are lots of cases where people, for various reasons, weren't on medication, either because they lived in a country where they couldn't access it or personal reasons not wanting to be on it, where they, the very first pill of whatever medicine they take, they have dyskinesias already. So it really is more, the, the, the thing that correlates most strongly with dyskinesias is how long you've had Parkinson's disease for. There's no correlation with how long you've been on medication for. There is a correlation with how much medicine you take every day, which makes sense because the more medication you take, the further into that the therapeutic window, you go above the upper limit where you start having the, the side effects. Um, but it really is more just the, Parkin something about Parkinson's progression sets up the, the circuitry in your brain and then the medication is sort of the fuel for those circuits and if you don't have dopamine around you're not going to activate the circuit basically uh, and we don't know any way to prevent it from happening it's just kind of one of the many mysteries of, of parkinson's disease okay, we do know also uh, we have quite a seem to be toxic so you're not going to do damage to the brain by being on medication for years as well mm -hmm. So we have quite a few questions in the chat box. So maybe we'll go back to the chat box and then come back to me if there's time. Sure. Um, are there specific exercises that would help freezing? Um, so yes, I think um, freezing is sometimes a tricky um, area to, to manage. Um, and again, it's it's kind of creating your toolbox of, of strategies to help manage that. and everyone's individual in, in what works for them. Um, a couple of things though that I find that I really practice with everyone that I see is what I call a lateral weight shift. So often when we're freezing, the focus is on trying to move forwards and really we need to redirect that movement somewhere else. And so it's really taking that time to stop and then doing a shift of your weight from side to side to then initiate a step forward rather than stopping and trying to step forward again straight away. Um, the other thing I also get people to practice is marching steps um, because um, ultimately when we're freezing, our, our movement is sort of stuck and small and it's trying to get a, a bolst into a, a big movement. And being able to um, turn is um, an area where people can often freeze more frequently and being able to practice a march and a turn at the same time is a challenge but definitely something I get people to practice because often um, it may be ideally in an ideal world you want to extend your walking circle your turning circle that you're in but there isn't the space to do that so when there isn't the space to do that you need to make your your movement bigger um, in the other direction sort of with the marching step and be able to combine that with a turn is a lot more tricky balance um, wise for that strategy. So that's definitely an exercise to, to practice if it's safe to do so. So you could do that at a counter, a kitchen counter, just doing quarter turns. You don't need to do a 360 turn round, um, just sort of a quarter turn, 90 degrees either way, marching your feet um, and a, a, a shift side to side. There are lots of other things that we would go through, but probably you need to practice those more individually um, with a therapist to see what would would work for you in your sort of sort of freezing. Mm -hmm. And some things people use what are called sensory tricks where you try to basically distract your brain. Um, so if you if there's a line on the floor, like you've got a tile floor, try to step over a line on the floor rather than thinking about walking forward and just changing what you're trying to do gets around that sort of short circuit in your walking software, or if so if you're with somebody, they can put their foot in front of your foot and you can try to step over their foot, something like that. Just doing what you're doing, in, but in a different way, for whatever reason seems to help. Um, 
but it is a challenging problem. Um, do you know if the government offers any subsidies for home renos in case we need to make changes like stand up shower or maybe changes with up or down stairs? Um, I actually don't know. I, um, Alana, you folks at the Parkinson Society would probably know more about this than we would, or Michelle might as well. Actually. Yeah, um, yeah, actually, I can comment on that. Yes, there is. Um, there is something called the Happy Program. Um, I'm not sure what your name is, but if you send me an email at adillon at parkinson.bc.ca, I can send you that information. Great. Uh, okay, then for Dr. myself and Dr. McKenzie, some of the research shows PD can start 10 to 20 years ahead of initial obvious symptoms like tremors or bradykinesia. Uh, what kind of research is being done in Canada in this regard? Um, so I think maybe what you're trying to get at is how do you diagnose people early on? Um, obviously, if, if someone develops a disease-modifying therapy, you ideally want to have it before you start having overt symptoms of the disease. Um, I actually am not sure exactly what research is happening in Canada in this regard. I can tell you that it's sort of one of the holy grails of Parkinson's research, having that what's called a biomarker where you have a test or a combination of tests that can accurately diagnose Parkinson's disease without having to carve up your brain and look at it under a microscope after you die. Um, but it's still very much a work in progress. I know the Michael J. Fox Foundation is doing, has a, has a, um, longitudinal study that they're doing called the Parkinson's Progress Progression Markers Initiative, um, of which multiple centers in Canada are participating. Um, but I don't know of any other specifics in Canada. Did you know, are you aware of anything specific, Dr. McKenzie? Uh, no, I, I just add that, that, you know, some of the markers like constipation are quite non-specific if it's happening 10 or 20 years before Parkinson's. So some of the work is looking at um, people who we know have a, a genetic mutation for Parkinson's sort of in their family or in themselves. Those people are important to look at. Uh, and then also people with sort of the acting out of dreams overnight. So the what we call the REM sleep behavior disorder. So both those populations are, are an active area of research, um, but it, it um, largely part of kind of bigger studies rather than just uh, one center. Great. Okay, and then when hallucinations are listed as a side effect, what exactly does the term hallucinations mean? Do you want to take that one as well? Sure. So uh, it's a good question. The mildest form of, of hallucination we often see in Parkinson's is people may notice a sense of presence. So they're alone in the room and they feel like someone is there with them. Uh, some people might start to notice some, uh, you know, shadows and they sort of misinterpret the shadow and think it's an animal or, or something in the room with them. Uh, with these very mild forms of hallucinations, people do tend to sort of look at the shadow again, realize it's not an animal, and so they still have insight that that's not actually something that's there. Um, so the hallucinations like that can come from the Parkinson's itself, and that's more common as the years go by. Uh, for hallucinations being caused by levodopa, they're often worsened if people already have a little bit of hallucinations before starting medication. Uh, and so kind of at the peak dose with the higher dopamine levels, the hallucinations can be uh, a little bit worse. So usually you might be working with your doctor to avoid those. For a lot of people, the hallucinations are not necessarily particularly bothersome, and we might not need to change medications um, just because someone has a little bit of that. Great. And then a few people commented that, that I guess, as drivers, you it seems you, ha you have to report your Parkinson's, but as doctors, we don't have to report your Parkinson's to ICBC. Um, so I guess that's some of the disconnect. Um, but as, as we said before, just having Parkinson's disease doesn't mean that they're going to take your driver's license away. Um, okay, is coffee beneficial for PD or does it make your tremor symptoms worse? It's a very good question. Um, so it, when, when people research risk factors for Parkinson's disease, coffee consistently comes up as a factor that protects protects people from Parkinson's disease. Um, it seems to be particularly for men for some reason and 
people who drink a lot of coffee, like the people who drink six cups or more of coffee per day seem to have a lower risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Um, we still don't know what that's all about. There have been some studies looking at caffeine supplementation. Um, there are caffeine receptors in the basal ganglia, um, but those caffeine studies have not shown to have any benefit for people with Parkinson's disease. Um, in terms of the tremor, any kind of, so coffee, caffeine is a stimulant. Any kind of stimulant will potentially make your tremor worse just because it, it's a stimulant, so it stimulates your brain, um, but it doesn't actually cause you any harm. So if you love your coffee and the tremor doesn't go totally out of control and isn't driving you nuts, you can still drink your coffee and you're not causing yourself any harm. But as far as we know, it's, we, we, I don't think we really know if it's beneficial at this point, but it doesn't seem to be harmful. Um, so Lars was saying a great webinar last summer. Uh, I'm not sure, Lars, what topic the, the webinar was. Um, if you could maybe post another message just saying what topic it was, I'm sure Alana would be happy to guide you to it. Um, yes. The I think maybe negative, driving, because a lot of the comments had been on driving. Right, yeah, potentially. Um, Okay, the medication sheet for levodopa states one of the precautions is having glaucoma. Uh, what is the connection and how severe? Um, so the, the, the caution, it, it's not so much for glaucoma, it's for people who have a specific type of glaucoma, which could potentially be precipitated by the levodopa, so closed angle glaucoma, which is not the typical form of glaucoma that most people have. So um, I would you know, mention it to your ophthalmologist if you're concerned, but it, it's quite, that type of glaucoma is really quite uncommon and it tends to present very acutely with eye pain and blurred vision and there would be no, no missing it essentially. Um, so I consulted a naturopath, any opinion on taking L-tyrosine? Uh, this helps to promote amino acids and management of stress levels. Did you want to comment? Sure. So, I mean, for a lot of these sort of naturopathic therapies, we don't have good evidence necessarily one way or another. So I don't, uh, for most people, I don't think this is going to be something that's necessarily specifically harmful to your Parkinson's disease. Uh, but I also don't have evidence that it's going to be particularly helpful uh, to your Parkinson's disease. So uh, amino acids are, are sort of, as we talked about already, the breakdown products of the protein that we're getting from the diet. Um, the tyrosine specifically um, is sort of a, a calming uh, uh, amino acid, if you will. So, you know, I remember getting some advice, don't have a turkey sandwich if you're writing a big exam, because uh, that'll put you to sleep. There's a lot of tyrosine in turkey. Uh, but in terms of specifically helping the, the Parkinson's, um, I don't think there's there's great evidence to, to recommend that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I just have a couple more questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. No, no, it's okay. Go ahead. I just had a couple more questions. Do we quickly have time? I know we're a bit over here. It's twelve nineteen. Yeah, I've got time. Yep. Okay. Uh, I think this is a person um, frustrated with wait lists. What's the difference between a neurologist and a movement disorder specialist? Can I see both over the course of my PD? Can a movement disorder specialist better understand and help me with my new diagnosis? Uh, yeah, so movement disorder specialists were neurologists who've sort of done extra training basically in, in not just Parkinson's disease, but other disorders as well that, that fall under that umbrella. Um, so, I mean, most of us spend most of our time managing Parkinson's, so we're more expert on it, but most, all neurologists should know enough about Parkinson's disease to help counsel you in the early stages. And certainly treatment wise, um, the, the treatment of early Parkinson's disease is relatively straightforward from, from a neurological perspective. So anyone should have um, expertise where having a movement disorder specialist really is helpful is when you have more advanced Parkinson's and things are getting very complicated and there's lots of different symptoms that are going on. Um, that can be more helpful, I suppose. Um, but certainly we see we see people across the spectrum. Um, one, one challenge that we have across Canada, it's not just BC, is that they're really, Parkinson's disease is really quite common and there aren't that many movement disorder specialists. And so um, I don't think there's any 
jurisdiction. I'm not. Sure, I'm not actually aware of any jurisdiction in the world where everyone with Parkinson's disease is followed, exclude followed by movement disorder neurologists. There just aren't enough movement disorder neurologists. Um, so often, what happens here is that you get seen at some interval in a movement disorder clinic, and then are seen in between by a general neurologist as well. And I know that that happens in Alberta, that happens in Toronto, that happens in, in many other parts of the country. Um, it's obviously it would be ideal if you had one doctor who did everything, but there's just not enough specialists, essentially. And it's, it's a question that we Thank grapple you. with how best to apply what resources we have <laughs> to help as many people as possible. But it, yes. there's no one, no one in the country, as far as I'm aware, has done, has found any great solution. But um, they're actually doing some research out of Ottawa, looking at different care models. So stay tuned. OK, and just two more quick questions. Can some PD medications cause cognitive decline? If so, which ones? And is it from long-term use? Uh, so some of the Parkinson's medications do have potential cognitive side effects. We often are, are more thinking that the, the Parkinson's itself can have some cognitive decline and the medications can worsen that. So sometimes if people are noticing some, some cognitive symptoms, that would be something to discuss with your physician for them to review, uh, to make sure that you're not on medications that would be worsening it. Certainly sometimes if we are able to uh, stop those medications in a safe way, then people do notice a little bit of improvement uh, in cognitive symptoms. Um, the levodopa, as we've talked about, kind of our mainstay of treatment, and that's the one that tends to have the, the least cognitive impact. But several of the other medications uh, can potentially have, have cognitive side effects. Uh, and certainly, lots of non-Parkinson's medications can have cognitive side effects. So a uh, really good idea to be kind of reviewing the whole list of things with your physician to make sure things are optimized. Yeah, and there there okay. is some concern. So there's one um, family of medications, particularly called anticholinergic medications, and those are actually very effective at treating tremor in people with Parkinson's disease. So they used to be used in the past, um, but th there is growing concern that chronic exposure to powerful anticholinergic drugs actually increases the risk of dementia, and that's for people without Parkinson's disease. So I think. I, I don't know of any movement disorder neurologists who would treat someone with Parkinson's disease with an anticholinergic, a powerful anticholinergic drug at this point. Having said that, as Dr. McKenzie said, many other commonly used drugs have some activity in that system, so they can have cognitive side effects. So we just have to be a little bit cautious. Thank you. And one last question, and perhaps a, um, a timely question, and something that is on everyone's mind right now. I'm concerned about the COVID vaccination. Is it safe if I have PD? Um, sure. We so the the short answer is we don't know, um, but probably. the The long answer is that um, the Around the world thus far, many people have gotten the vaccine without any significant safety issues. Um, many people in the, so, and there are many people with Parkinson's disease in nursing homes, and nursing homes for, in much of the world have been the focus of early vaccination programs. Certainly, that's true here. Um, and there have not been any major safety concerns. Uh, I think the risk of getting COVID-19 far outweighs any potential risks of the, the vaccine and the, the Movement Disorder Society, which is the, the main umbrella group that, that does all the Parkinson's education and research, has, has released a um, position statement basically strongly encouraging everyone with Parkinson's disease to get the vaccine as soon as it is available to you. So um, I can say that I got my first dose on Saturday and other than a sore shoulder for the next day I had no problems with it so yeah. I think also important to know there's there's actually no brain conditions where they've said uh, this isn't safe to get the vaccine so we don't have a, a good reason to think that the vaccine would be more dangerous for you and, and as Dr. Squire said uh, certainly we, ex we expect that the risk of getting COVID 
hugely outraise the risk of, of getting the vaccine. Um, and so we're, we're sort of in a position of, of strongly recommending it. Um, I also got my first dose on Saturday, uh, but it's, it's something I'm, I'm recommending to, to all of my patients. Mm -hmm. And just on that note as well, the, as far as we know, Parkinson's does not increase your risk of developing severe symptoms of COVID. Um, in the centers that have reported data in the UK and, and Italy, their people with Parkinson's were sort of overrepresented in hospitalized people with Parkinson's, uh, with COVID, sorry, but they also tended to be old and frail. And really it was probably their age and frailty that was the risk rather than Parkinson's. And certainly across all chronic health conditions, age is a much greater risk for getting severe COVID than any underlying disease, basically, which is why BC is prioritizing people based on age. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Squires, Michelle McCarthy, and Dr. Melissa McKenzie. Thank you so much for answering all of our questions. And I know we went a little bit over, so uh, we really appreciate that. And thank you everyone for participating in our webinar series. Um, and thank you for all of your great questions. Um, we will see you next time. And um, just a reminder that these uh, webinars are recorded and they will all be available on the website um, in about a week. Thank and just you. To, just a plug if everyone has a second. Um, we've never done this this way before. We've only actually done this one time before. And as, as Michelle mentioned, it was in person before. Well, we could still do such things. So if anyone has any comments as to whether you liked this series of webinars as opposed to like a morning, in a room, I personally would welcome that feedback. Yes, please do send any feedback uh, feedback to my email address and I will pass on any information to our presenters today. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.